Released after just five years in a facility for the criminally insane, Kemper went on a killing spree that targeted young female co-eds. She was hitchhiking home from school. She was taken out to a remote area where she was shot in the head with a 22 caliber gun. In all, the vicious serial killer would slaughter 10 people, including his mother. He would typically dismember and sexually desecrate the bodies, making Edmund Kemper one of the world's most evil killers. Kemper lived in Burbank in Southern California with his mother, Clarnell, his father, also called Edmund, and his two sisters. His father was a World War II veteran and had worked on nuclear testing before coming back after the war to work as an electrician. Ed's father used the expression suicide missions were nothing compared to living with Clarnell. Clarnell was an extraordinary personality. Neurotic, aggressive, alcoholic, and utterly domineering. She terrorized both her husband and her son, favoring the two daughters. In 1957, when Kemper was nine years old, his parents divorced. His mother took him and his two sisters to live with her in Helena, Montana. She would allegedly play havoc with the young boy's psyche. She demeaned him and she abused him and, and basically ostracized him and made him feel terrible. Kemper expresses more than almost any serial killer I've ever heard of, a hatred of his mother that's indescribable. The young Kemper developed some macabre fascinations. He would play games with his sisters, like gas chamber or electric chair. He would get them to tie himself to a chair. And then he would pretend to be electrocuted. Afraid that he would harm his sisters, when he was 10, Kemper's mother ordered him to sleep in the basement. Now, you can have two different views of this. One is that it's horribly cruel, and the other is this is a mother who did the only thing she could to protect her daughter. Regardless of the explanation, from Kemper's point of view, it was torture. And he reviled his mother. Aged 13, young Kemper took off and went to find his father in California. He goes and he finds his father, but his father doesn't really want to know because he's got a new life now, he has a stepson, he has this new family unit, and Ed feels incredibly rejected by that. But his mother rejected him too. A year later, she sent the boy, age 14, to live with his paternal grandparents on a farm in North Fork, California. It would be a fatal decision. His grandmother is very similar to his mother. She's incredibly domineering. She's not particularly nice to him. Kemper would grow to be an imposing physical figure. At 15, he already stood six foot four inches tall. He grew to six foot nine, weighed 21 stone, 300 pounds. He was, in a way, almost a Frankenstein figure. Tragically, the die was cast, and the powerful teen was about to strike with a monstrous rage. On August the 27th, 1964, a 15-year-old Kemper would kill for the first time. His grandmother is sitting at the kitchen table. Without really any warning, Kemper goes and fetches a rifle, which is in the house, and shoots her. In fact, he shoots her twice, just to make sure she's dead. Then he sits down at the kitchen table opposite the body of his grandmother and waits for his grandfather, and he shoots him too. Then, in a bizarre twist, Kemper made a surprising move. Immediately after he killed his grandparents, he calls his mother and he says, I've killed my grandparents. And she tells him, well, you, you stupid boy, just call the police and wait there until they arrive. And he sits there waiting for the police. He doesn't run, he doesn't do anything. And when they get there and explain, he said, why, well, I, I wanted to find out what it felt like to kill grandmother. 
Arrested and diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, Kemper was incarcerated in the Atascadero State Hospital in California. In the high-security facility for the criminally insane, Kemper seemed to have found peace. On May the 7th, 1972, Kemper's trial runs were over. On that day, Kemper picked up two young students in Berkeley, Mary Ann Pesky and Anita Mary Lucessa, both aged 18. They wanted a ride to Stanford University, about 40 miles away. Kemper's modus operandi, his MO, was pretty straightforward. He would drive around, he would look for hitchhikers, vulnerable, available. They had to have the characteristics which reminded uh, him of his mother, desirable. And then he would offer them a ride. These were co-ed girls. These were girls that were in college. They had their entire lives ahead of them. They were happy. And for him, this represented what he didn't have. These would often be girls that would reject him and he couldn't have relationships with them, but he still wanted them. So this was his way of actually getting access to these women. Kemper drove the two young women to some secluded woods. The big 300 pound man then got them out of the car and handcuffed both of them. Kemper then put one of the women, still alive, in the trunk of the car while he killed her friend. Often he'll say to them, I'm not going to kill you, in order to placate them and, and make sure that they, they, they don't make a fuss and try and run away. And then he does murder them, and then he has sex with their dead bodies. Kemper stabbed, then suffocated each girl in turn to death. He then put the bodies in the trunk of his Ford Galaxy and took them home to the apartment he'd now rented near to Santa Cruz University. There, he dismembered the bodies and gratified himself with the lifeless corpses. The horrifying aspect of Kemper now is that his sexuality is completely deformed. He cannot effectively operate sexually if the woman is alive. The only reason that he's not raping them before he kills them is that he doesn't want to be rejected by them. When you're having sex with a dead body, it's not going to reject you, it's not going to insult you or demean you in the same way that his mother had insulted or demeaned him. Kemper then stashed the body parts in plastic bags and stored some bits in his home and others in the trunk of his car. This is something that's known as partialism. It's a, a sexual arousal through, through keeping body parts. And I think for Kemper, this is his way of staying close to his victims, of owning them and possessing them and literally carrying a part of them with him. Kemper would later dump the violated body parts. The local police arrived to arrest the man who had just confessed to being the notorious co-ed killer. Kemper takes up the entire phone booth they get him into custody, put a hold on him, and the story now starts to get filled in and unraveled. We sent the district attorney, a district attorney investigator, and my partner, uh, Detective Alufi. They flew to Colorado, rented a station wagon, and the four of them took three days to drive back to California. They started out by saying, Ed, can you tell us how all this started? And he sat there like I am sitting here. And he said, on such and such a date and such and such a time, I was in Berkeley, California. Kemper connects every dot to every single case. He was so precise, we were able to link the evidence to his statements to the crime scenes. According to some analysts, after killing his mother, Kemper had lost his murderous purpose. He said later, I started feeling the folly of the whole damn thing. But he said, and I think more tellingly, the original purpose was gone. 
And that was, of course, Clarnell. Given how dysfunctional Kemper's relationship with his mother was, I think that perhaps had it been different, then, then Ed Kemper maybe wouldn't have gone on to kill all of the people that he did. So I think that Kemper's mother, she started writing the story of the serial killer, but Kemper finished that. On May the 7th, 1973, Kemper was indicted for the eight murders he had confessed to. His trial began five months later, on October the 23rd that year. But there was a twist in the case. Edmund Kemper pleaded not guilty. He had a great law team. They hired one of the best forensic psychiatrists in California, if not the United States. I got to say, they put on a great defense. He's all too aware that actually life in a state mental hospital is more favorable than life in prison. So he's making quite a calculated decision here to plead insanity, but he wasn't fooling anyone at this point in time. It's not our first rodeo. I've been to court a thousand times. You know what's coming. You know how a case is going to be attacked. On the prosecution side, we just keep putting the evidence in front of the jury how it connects to Edmund Kemper. It came down to really his state of mind. After just five hours of deliberation, on November the 8th, 1973, the jury declared Edmund Kemper sane and found him guilty of first-degree murder on all eight counts. This killer story begins in 1949. Robert Andrew Badella Jr. was born on January the 31st, the first of two sons. He was raised in Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio, in a strict Catholic household. His father worked at the Ford Motor Company. His mother was a homemaker, so they were very much the traditional American nuclear family. Badella was a shy, intelligent child who struggled to fit in at school. He was bullied by his peers because he did stand out as different. He wore very thick glasses. He went to the algebra club. He collected stamps. So there was that sense in which he always felt that isolation from his peer group. Then, in his mid-teens, his world was turned upside down. Badella's father died of a heart attack when he was 16, and this did have quite a significant impact on him because his mother remarried and she went on to set up another home with somebody else. And I think that Badella really did feel a sense of rejection here. He was part of his mother's past. The world had moved on and he was left behind. Around the same time, Badella had been working part-time. There's a particular incident that Badella later recalls that is potentially significant. Badella claims that he was raped when he was an adolescent at a restaurant where he worked. Badella never reported the incident to the police. In 1967, after graduating high school, Badella enrolled in Kansas City Art Institute. At this time, he'd begun exploring his sexuality. He'd realized that he was certainly gay. And it was pretty apparent to him that his father would not have approved of that. He's also been brought up in the Catholic Church, so I think there is very much an underlying sense of shame there. By 1969, Badella had begun to experiment with drugs. He quit college after tutors failed to understand his twisted art projects, often involving live animals. He may have been a bit nerdy to look at, and a bit strange, but he was clearly talented. In need of a job, Badella put his talents to a new use. Badella started working as a short order chef and quickly rose. He developed quite a good reputation in the local community as people were talking about the food that he was making. And he bought his own house. He had quite a bright future. He really was a figure that commanded respect in the local community. By his mid to late twenties, Badella had also developed a passion for collecting, and this hobby soon became a business in its own right. He was obviously a very good chef, but it wasn't his only talent. He also collected art and antiquities. This was a man of quite considerable taste, working at some of the best restaurants, and at the same time operating a boutique called Bob's Bizarre. Bizarre. 
selling art and antiquities. The boutique became Badella's full-time job and he began to rent out rooms in his home to help make ends meet. Some of those lodgers were vulnerable young men who'd received bed and board in return for carrying out jobs around the house and at his antique shop. People who'd run away from home, young gay men, uh, couples, uh, rather a sort of benevolent figure. Badella had developed a sick taste for torture and murder. And after getting away with his first crime, he began to look for ever-increasing horrific ways to get his sexual kicks. Nine months after he tortured and murdered his first victim, 19-year-old Jerry Howell, Robert Badella took his next victim. So Robert Sheldon was somebody who had stayed with Badella before at his house. So there was a degree of trust in this relationship, and it was trust that Badella really did take advantage of. On April the 10th, 20-year-old drug addict Robert Sheldon appeared at Badella's door looking for somewhere to stay after an argument with his girlfriend. Shortly after he set foot inside, Badella put his sadistic plan into action. He keeps him for four days. Automatically, you know that this is going to be somebody who's in distress. He starts to escalate his cruelty with this victim. He injects drain cleaner into his eyes. He fills his ears with corking material. There's damage to the hands from piano wire. He's hitting him with a rubber mallet. All of these things are acts of cruelty and they would not kill you. It's subduing the victim. He did some horrendous things to him, but the thing that really stood out for me was the tattoo that he gave this victim on his shoulder. He was almost branding this man, saying, you are mine, I own you and I possess you. Like he had with his first victim, Badella documented his methods by writing intricate notes. This time, he went one step further and included himself in the photographs with his tormented victim. He wanted an absolute record of everything he'd done. It was a certain amount of pride. There is no doubt whatever that that's what was in his mind. He documented it because he was proud of it. On the 14th of April, Badella arrived home to find a workman he knew on the roof of his property. Concerned that he'd be discovered, he decided to kill Robert. He becomes quite paranoid because he knows this guy. So Badella takes matters into his own hands and he goes and places a plastic bag over the head of his victim, essentially ending his life. Badella began his ritual act of cutting up his victim's body piece by piece. Dismembering a body is not the easiest thing in the world to do, but if you have some knowledge, like a surgeon or a chef, then you can quite effectively dismember a body, and that makes it easier to dispose of. This horrific expertise in chopping up bodies later earned Badella the nickname the Kansas City Butcher. In keeping with his obsession with collecting, this time Badella decided he wanted to keep a souvenir of his actions. Badella's second victim, Robert, he dismembered the body and cut off the head. But this time he didn't put it all into black garbage bags and put it out for the garbage truck. He kept the head first in the freezer in his house and he later buried it in the garden where it decomposed as a kind of trophy of the killing. And this is really significant for me because the head is what gives somebody their identity. It's what makes them a human. I think by keeping the head, Badella wants to be able to say, I'm the one that has depersonalized this individual. I'm the one that's dehumanized them. Badella had now tortured and murdered two people without being caught. On March the 29th, 1988, he picked up 22-year-old male prostitute Christopher Bryson and took him back to his house. So Christopher Bryson was wandering the streets when Robert Badella picks him up and he offers him a beer and they, they drive around in his car for a while. Badella then says, well, come back to my house and you can have a beer there. So Christopher agrees and they go back. 
he was brought home to provide sexual favors for, for Della and was told to go upstairs as soon as they got there. As Bryson mounted the stairs and started walking up, he was struck from behind and rendered unconscious. With his victim sedated and held captive, Bedella began his deadly ritual. Once again, he is tortured, he is assaulted, he is given bleach in the eyes, but this time it's swabbed onto the eyeballs rather than injected in. That would probably be even more painful. There are many nerve endings on the globe of the eye which would react very badly to the bleach. Repeatedly electrocuted, raped and injected with a cocktail of sedatives, Christopher remained a submissive captive for four days. But on the morning of April the 2nd, 1988, when Badella had left for work, Christopher managed to set himself free. He finds some matches and he's able to actually burn through the robes that Badella had restrained him with. So he flees the house wearing only a dog collar he must have been an extraordinary sight, a naked man wearing a dog collar. He runs across the street, meets a meter reader who's going to a house. They knock on the door. The house owner is astonished, opens the door, astonished, won't let Christopher into the house, but does call the police. Roy Orth was a sergeant with the Kansas City Police Department when they received the call. Chris had been severely physically abused uh, and was asking for help. District officers got there, found this was probably going to be some kind of an unlawful restraint uh, abduction situation, and called the uh, Sex Crimes Child Abuse Unit, and our detective responded. Rick Holtzclaw was the assistant prosecutor for the Sex Crimes Unit in Kansas City. Roy Orth called me and said, we need you. And I said, you don't need me today. Um, and he said, no, I'm telling you, we need you on this one. He may have told me briefly what it was, that we had someone who had escaped naked with a dog collar. It became evident that they were going to need some assistance. So I went to the home on that Saturday afternoon, and we began the investigation, getting search warrants. And that's how it began. In just over a three-year period, Bedella had held brutally raped, tortured, and killed six men and got away with it. Unknown to the police, they were about to uncover the shocking crimes committed by a sadistic serial killer, Robert Bedella. Troy Cole was the lead detective in charge of the case. I first became aware of him uh, April 2nd, 1988. Um, I was working in the homicide unit. It was a Saturday and uh, was called out in regards to a sodomy. The guy alleged that he'd been kidnapped and held captive for a number of days, and I was the duty sergeant, which meant that I handled the homicides, the robbery, and the sex crimes for that particular day. Christopher managed to escape and flag down a passerby. That's what brought us to the residence. The traumatized victim recounted his ordeal and gave police the name and address of his captor, when Berdella arrived home that evening, the police were waiting for him. He was born in Pittsburgh, Kansas on March the 9th, the eldest of four boys born to William and Dorothea Rader. Rader was born in 1945, and he was one of several children within a, a very traditional nuclear family. His father was strict, but not particularly abusive, and many children grew up in households like this. He was upright, he was a scout, he was on all sorts of programs for good children. He had the ability to blend in. He wasn't bullied, for example, as a lot of killers are. To his friends and family, he was a model child, but in private, Raider began to show his true colors. Raider claims that when he was a youngster, he abused animals, so he hung a cat and he hung a dog. We do see, in quite a few cases of serial killers, animal harm in the background. As he went into puberty, he had described himself as looking at girly mags, developing a fascination with underwear, and then, significantly, and indeed deeply significant in his later crimes, 
was a fascination with bondage and sadomasochism. Having graduated from a local high school in Wichita, in 1965, Raider enrolled in Kansas Wesleyan College in Salina, 90 miles from home. However, he dropped out. In 1966, when Raider was 21, he joined the United States Air Force and remained in it for four years. He worked on systems. He was that kind of man. Systems are very much his kind of thing. He served abroad, sometimes in Europe. As far as we know, not a particularly distinguished career, but not a bad one. He returns to Wichita, Kansas, and marries a girl he was at school with. Raider marries and has two children. And from the outside, they do very much look like the respectable cereal box family, just like any other regular American family. In 1974, Raider suddenly and inexplicably changed from the respected X-Forces gentleman to a brutal evil killer. There has to be something that set him off, because that first explosion of violence was so shocking, so dramatic, so utterly horrifying that you couldn't possibly have imagined it was like going from naught to 60 in two seconds. A new family to the neighborhood became his first victims. The Atari family had recently moved to Wichita because they wanted a new start. This was the beginning of a, a new chapter in their lives. But unfortunately, this was to be very short-lived because one day the teenage children arrive home to the most horrendous scene. On January the 15th, 1974, Wichita police were called to the scene. Detective Tim Ralph was one of the task force investigators on the BTK case in later years. At the Otero house, they were actually called by the children. The three older children had come home, and uh, uh, they had found uh, their mother and father. They called, and the first responders, or the first people that arrived at that time, they, they went to the bedroom. They found the father and the mother. The scene they discovered was horrendous. Dennis Rader had broken into the family home and murdered everyone in the house in a way that would become his trademark. He binds, ties up husband and wife with a Venetian bind cord, suffocates them. The older children didn't want their younger siblings to come home and find this because they thought they were at school. And so the officers went to their elementary schools in the area and found that both of the younger siblings had not made it to school that day. When officers searched the house, it soon became clear that the parents weren't the only victims. Nine-year-old Joseph and his sister Josephine, 11, were both found murdered. Their 11-year-old daughter is found hanging in the basement, whether he killed her by hanging her or strangled her and then strung up the body. We have a situation where he's created elaborate knot work and hung the body up. It's almost like some sort of macabre art display. Rader appeared to have fixated on the younger daughter, Josephine, because he seems to have spent the most time with her body. She was the prize, and the others were just obstacles that he had to get out of the way. He kills the boy, ties him up, leaves on the floor of his bedroom, again suffocated. Raider had killed four members of the Otero family, 38-year-old Joseph, 33-year-old Julie, 9-year-old Joseph Jr., and 11-year-old Josephine. The Otero case provided an overall mindset of this person, that he certainly was into some kind of minding fantasy. The way Raider had killed the family showed the beginnings of what would become his modus operandi. The police found semen at the scene, so there was clearly a sexual element to this offending. And they also discovered that the faces of some of the victims were quite bloated, which suggests that the killer strangled them 
and then stopped strangling them and then strangled them again. So literally holding them on the edge of life and death, watching the life drain out of them and then giving it back. So having that power over somebody's survival or somebody's demise is something that this killer very much enjoyed. This was not, sadly, the act of a madman. It was the first of a series of killings in Wichita that would come to terrify the town. In January, they have the Otero killings. In April, they have Catherine's killing and Kevin's attack. They have no idea what they have on their hands. I don't imagine they get an awful lot of these kinds of attacks in Wichita. By the end of the year, the police thought they'd had a breakthrough in their investigation of the killings. In October 1974, and the police arrest three men on the suspicion of the Otero killings. Raider is furious. This is an outrage. Those were my killings. Nobody else. I'm not. I'm not a, this is it's not accept, absolutely not acceptable. You can almost hear him saying it to himself. This is not right. Incensed that his murders are being attributed to someone else, Raider wrote a letter to the local newspaper, the Wichita Eagle, and hid it inside a textbook at the Wichita Public Library. He then phoned the Otero murder hotline to describe where the letter could be found. In his letter, claiming credit for the Otero killings, it's not quite um, well written. It's uh, clumsy, misspelt, bad grammar, but the overall motive is absolutely clear. Raider attempted to justify the killings with the phrase, I can't stop it so the monster goes on and hurt me as well as society. Society can be thankful that there are ways for people like me to relieve myself at time by daydreams of some victims being torture and being mine. Understanding the fear he was causing, Raider went one step further and gave his murderous alter ego a name. He wanted a brand, he wanted an identity. He didn't just want to be a nameless killer. So he didn't want to get caught, and he also wanted recognition for his crime. So he had to come up with a moniker, Bind, Torture, Kill. Dennis Raider was to be known as BTK, and as he communicated with the press, Raider made a chilling threat that he was to strike again. Police still didn't have enough to make an arrest. They needed hard proof that Dennis Raider was the BTK killer. They have got no probable cause to demand a DNA sample from Raider, so they take the unlikely step of going to the hospital asking for a cervical smear that his daughter had given and comparing the DNA that they got from various crime scenes, the semen they'd found. And they find that it's extremely close. The match is in Queen, must be a family member. The police could finally move in. A large contingent of people <laughs> were sent toward Park City on uh, February the 25th of 2005. And at 12.15, he was taken into custody. Raider is finally arrested and is eventually charged with 10 murders, including the Oteros. The police had many crimes they suspected Raider and his alter ego BTK of committing. But at that time, only he knew the full extent of the truth. The interrogation was a delicate affair. We had broken up the case into several different sections, so we started to rotate in investigators, and he would be more than a year and talked for almost 34 hours. And he almost saw himself as an instructor of, as he called it, uh, you know, the, the golden age of serial killing. When they're done with the interviews, I'm back from doing my search warrants. He's in the interview room and they put the, the vest on him and they're hooking him up with the shackles and belly chain and that kind of thing. And I just kind of stuck my head in the door and said, um, it's nice to be able to put a face, go along with the name that I found on the floppy disk. And he looks up and he's kind of got this, the shackles like that and looks up and says, oh, so you're the one, huh? And I said, yeah, I'm the one. So we uh, kind of joked back and forth. And he was, it was in good mood. He was joking and he said, oh, if I ever get out of here, I'm gonna have to find you and stuff your mouth full of a case of floppy disks. Finally, the infamous BTK was off the streets 
and in custody. So we, we took him over to the jail. Everybody in the holding cells and area in there knew that it happened. The cells in there are all glassed off, and so all the inmates in there, they all come up to the glass, and they're looking at the glass, and then they start pounding on the glass, chanting his name, chanting, you know, pounding on the glass, and BTK, BTK. And then he's got a big old smile, and he's got his hands there, he goes, two thumbs up, as he's two thumbs up to everybody chanting his name. So, I mean, he just loved that. On the 1st of March, 2005, Dennis Rader had been charged with the murders of the Otero family, Catherine Bright, Shirley Vian, Nancy Fox, Maureen Hedge, Vicky Wegerly, and Dolores E. Davis.